if all of the artists could um, go up onto the stage, they will be joined by moderator Christian Frock. Yes, as you can see, they're all very similar, their practices. So this is gonna be a very cohesive summary of the day. Thanks so much, you guys. That was really awesome. So I wanna start this off by kind of going back to a couple of things that kept coming up as you each talked about your individual practices. I. Some of you work interventionally, and some of you work deliberately, directly engaging with the public. And so one of the things I'm curious about um, in relation to your own practices is how you think about whatever responsibilities you have in doing work in public space, if you have them. And anyone can start there. There is. I feel like um, the whole gist of my thing is connecting strangers because that's what I like to do, and I feel like that's kind of what's missing, that we make a lot of assumptions about one another without really challenging it. So I'm doing that myself, and um, in doing that, I've made a lot of mistakes and recognized a lot of things that I've, I've overstepped or in the thinking I'm empathetic to people, but it was really me still stepping on things. So I think it's a process that I'm willing to take so that I can figure out a way to facilitate it for others. Um, let's see. From the teaching standpoint, I teach and, um, and I go over, and I've done a lot of stuff in public space with students and stuff, and I think a huge thing is thinking about, uh, again, consequence for actions and keeping your body safe, keeping your mind safe. And um, and within those, and one of the rules is if someone asks you to stop, um, stop, don't stop. If someone asks you again, then consider it. Um, and the other rule was not get arrested. Um, and, and this is in the context of being in class. Um, but I think one of the things is to think through consequences for actions. And I'm going more towards performance in these things because. Um, I want weird, messed up stuff to happen in public space. So um, I I will throw things to the wind and just kind of try stuff. Um, and a lot of these like like revised things are all coming out of spontaneous weird things. Um, so I I I think there's something with you're trying to be safe in public space, but I think I think you need to challenge the space too. So I, th I think spaces need to change and they need to be affected. So um, that would be the other thing I'd add to that. So when you talk about wanting to see weird stuff happen in public space, are you going into it with a set idea of this thing that you're going to do and, and this is tied to the outcome or is it just I need to be as weird as possible in public it's space? Not, it's just being weird. Um, I think it's letting your strange ideas filter into I mean, I come come from a queer household, so like who you are and your identity was um, not necessarily something you made public, um, and that's kind of changed with time um, as I become, you know, as time unfolds. But I think there's something about that private being messed up and very present in public, and you know, all these things that are inside of us, so you know, are then out um, in some way in that public space. So um, I think I follow more of those things. I just said, um, actually, um, I don't consider our, our work necessarily um, deliberately performative in the same way, but they're happy accidents. And, and it just, it, it's, totally, it's not what you wanted to talk about, I know. Um, <laughs> we, were, um, we were, about a year ago, we showed a film in, in the Hamptons International Film Festival in New York, and it's probably the whitest and, and the wealthiest place I've ever been to, and we couldn't pay uh, the babysitter for the award ceremony and they asked us to come and we, we got an award. And, and so it's the two of us and our then six-year-old who doesn't look like us, who's a kid of color. And we go up and we get the award and we thank them and we go down and one of the other filmmakers come to me and says like, that was fantastic because these people need to see that there are other populations and, and that are doing, and we didn't even think about it. So in some ways it's like there is a public persona that you take with you, whether you you, you meant to take it or not. And it was, for, for me, it was kind of a turning point to think of 
what can we do, not just with the film, but also with ourselves? And, and why do you insert yourself, not necessarily as a um, look at me thing, but, but I am carrying myself. And, and we are carrying a very, I would say, a strong politics and strong opinions with the film. Where are the places that you actually want to have somebody else talk about it? Where are the places that you can actually create a space, even if it's by accident? You wanted to talk about something totally different. I wanted to That's talk. Still there. <laughs> That's the thing about collaboration, right? I wanted to talk about the fact that I think that um, to be um, British, um, Israeli, you know, I'm actually dual citizen, but here, kind of, um, you know, the whitest person, always the person who could probably officially apologize to everyone here for colonizing them. And so um, to actually to be working on a project with basically people who are, majority of them are um, non white. Um, working with families that are often from, um, you know, not particularly wealthy um, areas and in dire straits, really complicated, is a very, is a very complicated uh, situation. Um, and it was something that we didn't go into lightly. And then the notion of representing other people is very complicated too. On the other hand, I think that um, we were invested in telling stories that felt important to us. And when people have asked questions about, like, why do you want to do something that is about a black man, is about, you know, the veterans in this community, is about, is about you know, people on death row, um, because all of the issues that that brings up are actually responsibilities that I think are personally are important to me. Um, and then the other thing which I think I want to say about that is I, don't, I think it's really hard for us in that we do have someone at home, you know, now a seven-year-old, who actually looks a lot like some of the people that we are interviewing, but I want to make sure that we don't either, you know, post a child, our child, um, but also that I have an investment in, in communities and issues that I think I don't necessarily want to have to go, hey, by the way, this is, this is why I care about this. And I think those are really complicated places one of the things I often tell my students, because I teach too, is um, what's the possibility of like allowing someone else to be you? What if you go into public a, a, a space that's like you, or you, or you, who's not me? You know, because uh, you know, there are certain privileges that Nomi claims that I can take by returning things because I have a British accent. And so what if I, you know, I'm your personal vehicle for kind of communicating those projects. There were some thoughts about that. That's great. Um, I wondered if um, Anna or... Um, Kota, if, Anna, I want you to, no, no, nice try. I want you to, <laughs> I'm going to get you all to talk. Um, Anna, I want you to talk a little bit about working in communities outside of the United States, outside of your own community, and going into those spaces and thinking about ways to knit community and what those responsibilities are in terms of making things for and with the community. Well, I think I grew up in a heavily political family in a very small town in Mexico, and I think we were always, I was, I was always very aware of how either the community was being portrayed in the media, you know, the reality versus, you know, what the, the voice, um, the portrayal was versus the reality. So the shadow and the Plato's cave, I was always super intrigued by that. Um, and I've always had a fascination with languages. I thought that was going to go down that that avenue and become a linguist. And so I speak five languages. However, with art, I, be, I became aware of how much more expensive it was. And I I'm just really intrigued by how the media portrays all these places. And Haiti was in the in the media quite a bit in 2006. I was applying for the full for the Fulbright and having grown up in in, um, in Tijuana and San Diego for a while. Um, I thought that Haiti and the Dominican Republic was such an interesting location to be um, to be working, and I thought, well, there's this triculturalism that happens where it's no longer just Tijuana and San Diego, but it's like Mexico, Amer the United States, Mexico, and then the thing that breeds the third entity that breeds within that location, which is this triculturalism that they speak a different way. And so Haiti became. For, for me, a, a place where I became really intrigued by, and it's just, um, and seeing the reality versus what gets put in the media, and trying to actually work with with the people there, and 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 portray a different reality, portray the take the narratives that they tell me, and being able to kind of extract that and 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 narrate that back, and using art as a vehicle in which you can transcend the the, the given that's being spotlighted and, and create a different story and, 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 and articulate, you know, voices that are, are not heard. And so for me, that's always been like, how can I take this muteness and put volume to it with visual? That's great. Thank you. Kota, could you talk a little bit about, um, you've done m m many like, sort of 
not necessarily permanent, but you are working on a, a permanent piece for the um, SFO, but I was actually one of the jurors for your piece um, at Yerba Buena, and so I'm very familiar with that piece. Can you talk about what that, like SFO is a, in a way a very public civic space. It, the, the world tr passes through there, it's very global. And so how do you, you said at one point, well, you can't put a black and white piece in an airport. My first thought was why? So I wanted to know what you were thinking about in terms of what it needs to be when it's in a space like that. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to go back to the responsibility oh, thing. Um, <laughs> because I find just to do uh, art in public is a, I feel like a responsible act uh, because uh, most people uh, really dislike public art. I mean, there's so much uh, art, plop art, you know, sculptures in, uh, that people uh, point their fingers at. And by putting something in public, you risk of being that guy, you know, you risk, like, there's that ugly thing by so and so. And, um, but, and so the easy thing would be like, no, I prefer to show at this left wing gallery and I don't want to do anything in a public space where everybody can scrutinize your work forever and ever. And, um, but I, yeah, I, I kind of think it's a, I also uh, like when, you know, left wing activists end up taking a mayor job or something like that. So I find it's kind of something, a responsible thing to do. As and an artist or as a citizen? Hmm? As an artist, it's the responsible thing to do to put your yeah, work in public yeah. space? Great. Did you get that, Packard? OK, good. <laughs> or, or uh, you know, of course, not every project lends itself to be in a public space like that. But when you're asked, when somebody says, uh, can you put it there, then you know, do it, uh, even though people might nag on it afterwards. <laughs> Um, about SFO, and uh, I mean, all these, uh, my projects are all very slow. I, I sit in my garage and make these drawings, and it takes me a really long time. But the whole uh, idea process is super quick. So when uh, I remember the for the SFO, there was a side visit with the artists, and I didn't really have the mind to put my mind even there what to do at SFO. And then I think it was, you know, the night before going to SFO, I thought, what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? And then I thought, uh, Beatles. And Were they playing? Were the Beatles on in the garage? Sorry? Were, were you listening to the Beatles when you came to that conclusion? Uh, I go through my Beatles phase together with my... I mean, the Beatles, uh, well, I mean, I'm not saying that they're the coolest rock band on earth or something like that, but they're, I, what I like about them is that everybody has a relationship to them in some way, you know, uh, even people that don't even listen to music. And, uh, yeah. Great. Cliff, could you talk a little bit about, especially because you do more performative interventions. I'm familiar with the piece that you did for ATA about San Francisco changing San Francisco. That ended up being a series of illustrations for Mark Taylor's essay about San Francisco for KQED. So it took on like a, an extended public life. Um, but you also do these other projects that are more performative and interventionist. And I'm just curious to hear you talk, especially I'm really thinking about that acts uh, performance, I bet the gallery still smells like that. And so, you know, what are some of the responsibilities yeah. that you think about? Well, it's funny with the Axe thing is that that, that <coughs> perfume, in, it's not really perfume cologne, but it's cheap and it's all low. I mean, it's, it's, it's made to hit you hard and then dissipate quickly. And I did the same performance uh, in, uh, at the, at, uh, <coughs> the San Francisco Museum of Art where I just stood there and emptied the whole can and then just walked out and trailed the scent uh, through the museum. And they were very worried about it. They, they, they <laughs> took it on like, oh, we have to put these filters on and we have to get a, uh, an expert in here and you know these chemicals are gonna be released. But my friend Bruno Fazolari, who's this amazing perfumer, is like, don't worry about it, Cliff, it's cheap and it'll just disappear. And, and that's what happened. It disappeared. <laughs> um, but in terms of doing, I sometimes feel, um, Especially lately as a citizen of uh, San Francisco, I feel uh, voiceless. I feel like everything is um, turning to shit in San Francisco. 
uh, the way artists are being treated, the way money, so much money is being poured in, the way all this money just completely disregards art, unless it's in a fun context where they can all understand it or go to the desert and hang out with other art that's out there in the desert. And it drives me nuts. And uh, that's what this piece came out of. It was kind of a reaction to like, I'm going to try to, in one weird way, get to these people. It was kind of a provocative poke at them. And whether or not they were paying attention to the signs, I don't know. But it did cause uh, some kind of dialogue to happen because people were paying attention to the signs in the windows. Um, but yes, yeah, as, as a public performer, I I don't know. It, I, it's selfishly, I do it for myself. And if I can connect with people, uh, in some way, I think that's great. That's always going to be gravy. But I do selfishly always do it kind of for myself. And uh, uh, I, I, would I, I, I would like to say I connect with people uh, as much as possible, but you, you never know. You have to kind of go into these performances and just do your best. And if a couple people get it, great. And if more people understand and want to get into it, that's even better. But that idea that it needs to have some, that it needs to be something more than what the artist does for themselves is relatively new, right? Chris talked about plop art um, early, during his talk, and for a long time there was just this expectation that you could drop a statue in a public space and you've done your civic duty, and that's all art needs to be. This more performative aspect, interventionist, even thinking about film as a public um, gesture, this is newer. And so I think it's actually worthwhile to say that your first responsibility is to yourself as an artist to carry through the thing that you want to do. And that leads me right to these two right here. Because and Wofford's practice is so multivalent. So now we're going to have a public fight. <laughs> it's going to be rad. <laughs> <laughs> What was the question? <laughs> They've just formed a new collaboration. <laughs> now, you two, individually, talk about what you think your, I mean, your projects are so multivalent, yours as well, Mike, but Wofford, sometimes your work takes place online, sometimes it's in public space, sometimes it's performative. What do you guys think the responsibilities are of putting work out in public space for you as an individual? Oof, I think for me it really varies depending on the form it's taking. Like I think when it's been performance uh, pieces, um, much as I'm a big ham on many levels, it also induces enormous amounts of anxiety in me. So I find that one of the ways that I manage that in terms of how that makes, you know, my, my responsibilities to a, a greater public is I tend to find collaborators and people that can make it a different kind of shared process. Um, I think that that just enriches it on a different kind of public level, just by simply relinquishing a certain amount of control for the project. Um, I don't, I don't know. I feel less conflicted with the more illustration-based projects I do. The web stuff is web stuff. I, I like that as a certain kind of public space. But I guess with the other two projects on Market Street and Mission Bay on the sidewalks, I think that one of the things I really like about public art, at least with working with the San Francisco Arts Commission, is that. I actually kind of just geek out on the, all the processes, like how many kind of review boards you have to, some artists hate that stuff, like completely hate it, but I actually really like it. It makes, it makes me feel accountable. It allows me to get feedback earlier in the process to sort of know what is working and what isn't. Yeah. Um, so I, I think my practice, uh, it, my, my practice in the public realm is very quiet. You know, it's, it's more about um, engaging the landscape and being present. It's more of a kind of poetic gesture than anything. And it's, it kind of operates on a leave no trace kind of ethos. So I'm just passing through. This isn't mine to keep. This is just, I'm just here for the time being um, observing. Um, when working with public art, I'm, I'm working, at one of the, some of the slides that I didn't show um, is a project in Chinatown where um, the San Francisco Art Commission budget and the DPW budget uh, kind of came together to make benches. And, um, and What's the DPW? Department of Public Works. So they were gonna do benches and then the Arts Commission, um, I guess, is working with them and now it's their art benches. And I feel like when, when working on a permanent public art project, I really think about the community that's gonna be engaging the work and the work has to have a relationship um, and a deep responsibility to 
kind of maintaining, um, I don't know, not necessarily civility, but a, a kind of um, uh, a place for, for the com community to kind of come together in a way. So benches, those posts in, on Valencia Street, I feel like they, there leaves a trace. Um, you know, so I, depending on which and how long, because one is very impermanent and one is very permanent, so I kind of treat them very differently. Uh, but as an artist, citizen, I, I think about kind of boys' um, kind of social sculpture in that we are co contributing to this larger global culture. You know, we, each thing that we do contributes to this thing that we call culture. Beautiful. Courtney, do I get to ask more than oh, wait, one can question? Can I add something to that? Yeah, please I, do. I think something, too, is that um, it also depends with public projects, like where um, funding's coming from. Are you coming out of your own pocket? You know, there's a different kind of freedom there. Um, if you get a grant, like, say, um, from the Art Commission or something else, or a foundation, there's a different level of expectations and responsibilities that go with funding and also working with the community. So I think those things also factor into the type of work being produced sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I have more time. I'm gonna ask another question. So the other thing that I wanted to ask directly related to um, responsibility is what your idea of success looks like in placing work in public space. Is it? And that can be all over the place because sometimes you do very solitary work. And so I'm curious to know, like Allison, you talked about your first roadside stand. You had no interaction with anybody, but it lended, it sort of launched into a whole other project and continued into many other projects. And so success could be delayed as well. So I'd like to have each of you talk about how you define success with your work, especially in relation to public engagement. Success will be if I ever get that roadside attraction. I mean, this has just been my journey to get there, you know, uh, at coming from that hermit perspective, really. I mean, my mom used to describe me as being morbidly shy, you know, to make that step out of that realm and into the public to kind of get at this vision I had for myself. I'm still working on it. So success would be able to get that space where I could talk about kind of these internal pro processes in a public way because I found community in that with old processes that I think are still valid. Whether they are or not, it remains to be seen. That was partly why I, wanted, I started, and um, we didn't quite get to, get to the heart of what we wanted to say in our, in our talk, which was partly why I talked about um, where the project went. I mean, we, we come from a fine art background, and, uh, and we were working in collaboration with these family members, and we were not sure what the, um, the final result would be. We ended up with animation because it felt like a way to have anonymity for a certain group of people that needed it. And then we realized that we could actually communicate metaphors and ideas through that. Um, we were really not sure what we were going to do. We did installations, we've done um, videos in galleries, um, and then realized because we had such an incredibly powerful story that it probably needed to be a linear narrative film, so we kind of stumbled into film. The part that was most successful for me about that was the fact that because it ended up having this other audience from one we hadn't anticipated, going from a film festival where we, we, we managed to win this award and then going to the Oscars, was all of a sudden it got you know, 191 press uh, interviews throughout the world. It got uh, 200 screenings. And then the really kind of like significant thing about that was all of a sudden organizations that we had really first wanted to connect to, like um, prison reentry programs and uh, education and also the United Nations and, and against the death penalty, started coming to us and asking us to work with them and connect on the project. And then we also had people start writing to us um, that had seen the film, connected with all the other um, shorts in the short category of the Oscars, saying that they had seen the film and it actually changed their opinions about the death penalty. So it kind of, for, for someone who's, you know, we went to Mills, we're art people, right? And all of a sudden we ended up with this, this kind of public forum in a way we had never anticipated. And one of the things I think was really interesting for me about that, and we're still grappling with, is how the, the fact that it had such a public face in a kind of like, you know, kind of 
you know, who ever imagined we would go to the Oscars, for God's sake, you know. Or and Netflix, <laughs> right? Like Netflix. Netflix. That's yeah. the ultimate we know, yeah, distribution. We, you know, the, and all, two people more unlikely to go to the Oscars, I can't even imagine. So, but, you know, so, you know, but the fact that it did those things and then what happened was it actually got the, that issue in a very particular way to a much more public audience. It was a really fascinating thing for us thinking about art venues and who you end up talking to within an art venue and who you end up talking to if it ends up going in these more public arenas. So I, I, that was, for me, one of the most interesting things about this project and thinking about how, and that's what happens in the public sphere quite often, is who stumbles into your project, who wanders along the road. So I don't know, and, and collaboration for us was with the community that, that, and the people we're communicating with, Community Resource Initiative, are like, oh, I always knew it would do really well. I was like, oh my God, you did? I didn't. You know, I didn't think it would have that kind of forum. So I just, I think that's just a really, I don't know, I, I don't quite know how to unpack that yet. But it's a really well, interesting it's, consideration. It's, it's, it's in some ways just to think about the, the power that, relatively speaking, mainstream uh, recognition brings yeah. along. And, and, and it, was, it was an incredibly uh, satisfying moment to say that all these people, we also hit a momentum, uh, uh, definitely been in the news, I would say, the past uh, probably year and a half prior to that, or, or nearly every day there was something on mainstream media. So I think that <laughs> we hit the right moment. But for us to think that something that we cared about that we couldn't get funding for until until later on, and all of a sudden, save Creative Work Fund. Um, it, it was really a big. We felt like it. it the, it's, it's a big shift in in public opinion, and we were part of it. I don't think we necessarily created it, but we definitely were part of it. Can I just say about the reason we couldn't get funding for it is that most um, nonprofits uh, or, fu or foundations won't fund the death penalty. It's too controversial for their funders if that makes sense. So actually, we, we couldn't apply for everything. We would look to the Ford Foundation, all other foundations, and then read the small print, you cannot fund th things that are about the death penalty. Um, anyway, so. uh, in a really quick way is that I think just doing stuff and um, the need to share is like a really basic need with making art. And um, I think, you know, what there was such instant gratification through groans and laughs and yelling at me and other things that came with doing things in public space for the first time um, that are already kind of successful because you're having to deal with the world again. And, you know, I think those are like really important skills that you learn when you're having to inter interact with, you know, in public space. So it's just really important, especially just, just to share work out there. Anybody else want to add? How, how do you... Yeah, Kota, I, yeah I, I think it's super difficult to measure success because <clears throat> if you, I mean, money or public recognition or all of these things feel kind of shallow because I find because uh, if everybody looks at your world work, I feel it's very easy to get sick of your own work. And um, if you're doing something just for yourself, it's also sometimes a little isolating so uh, I find the success is also really just to do it, to be able to do it and to keep, to continue to be able to do it. What about when you talked about your sculpture that was three feet, you know, three feet wide <clears throat> and it was scaled up for the gallery in Vancouver and life, you know, larger than life size in public space. Does that feel like some sort of, you know, you, D. Nomi, talked about you know the unexpected success of um, the film going to the Oscars. These things that you don't even think to dream of, do they feel like that takes the work to a new level of success, like having a, a much larger sculpture out of something yeah, that started out really small? Of course. I mean, it was super exciting when they were carrying these big pieces mm -hmm. that I was uh, really excited. But then when they put it all together, there's also some kind of level of anxiety that sets in because then you realize that it's not the piece that it was a year ago when it was this tiny thing in your studio and that everything changed about it and you have to now deal with it. I'm ignoring Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> we have one minute if anyone else has last thoughts on success. Uh, Mike? Yeah, well, in terms, I, I want to just piggyback on what Kota said about being able to do what, what you love doing. Like a, like a, a Carlos Villa quote is, 
um, if you've been doing, you've been successful, you've been able to do your practice for 25 years, you're successful. Yes. And, and I feel like that, that's a, a baseline that I like to think about because it, it allows you to relax about benchmarks of successes, you know? So. The whole row of people just nodded when you said that. <laughs> so uh, those of you that stuck it out, I just want to remind you, there's a hashtag for that. You can continue this conversation with the hashtag Rain in Open Spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> Courtney.